Hey everyone, it's Pam, and today I'm making another collection video, and this time I'll be going over all my video game books and strategy guides. So books and strategy guides isn't a thing I have a huge collection for, but I do like the occasional nice coffee table book with some nice artwork. I've got some specific art books for particular games, and then I've got some strategy guides, mostly for games that I've played before and just uh, have a special meaning to me, things that I'm particularly a fan of. So. In talking about this collection, I'm going to start with the bigger sort of coffee table books. So the first coffee table book is The Art of Point and Click Adventures, and I actually did a full review of this on my channel earlier this year. It's by Bitmap Books, and they sent me this copy for free, which was very nice of them. It's a beautiful book. It covers everything from sort of the start of point and click adventure games uh, with King's Quest all the way to much more recent games. I think it goes up to 2017? Yeah, I think 2017 is the further furthest it goes with the Dark Side Detective, but it sort of covers everything in between there. There's also some great interviews with artists, developers, designers. I did actually, over the last few months, read this from cover to cover. I wanted to read through all the interviews, and it was very interesting. It was actually one of the things that prompted my much more thorough video on The Dig. Um, it was an interview with one of the developers in here that sort of sparked the idea for that video. So this is a beautiful one. Um, definitely recommend it if you're into point and click adventure. So the next book covers another of my favorite genres, and it is the CRPG book. This is another one that was compiled by Bitmap Books. Um, it was originally something that was available just as a PDF, and I guess there was some kind of deal to have it published in this beautiful hardcover edition. It is similar to the adventure game one in that it sort of takes games, goes through the games through time. It starts uh, back in 1978 with Beneath Apple Manor and it goes all the way up to, uh, looks like 2015's where it ends with Pillars of Eternity. Every significant game in the genre is given a little write up, a little review, talks about it a bunch. So I do definitely want to go through and read this entire book. I just haven't gotten to it quite yet. So this one is actually Will's. He got it as a gift from our friend Dean from the Cartridge Club, and it is a compendium of the Sega Mega Drive. And as you may know if you follow me, I haven't ever played a Sega Mega Drive game, but it is a very cool book that goes over sort of a bunch about the games, but also about the actual system. Like it's got some schematics and things in it, which is really cool. Um, and then of course some artwork from various titles and some um, sort of character models and designs and things. Uh, and screens from sort of all of the games that were released on it. It's another cool one, um, just full of great art as well as some information about the system. Of course, the Mega Drive isn't a system I know a whole lot about, but the NES is definitely more my speed. This is the ultimate Nintendo Guide to the NES Library, and this has basically mini reviews of every single um, NES game. I'm pretty sure it's just North American releases, uh, but it's been kind of a cool little guide for me. Sometimes when I'm deciding what I want to play next, I'll take a gander through this, give the, give the reviews a little once over to see if it's something that I want to consider playing. Um, and this just weighs a ton. I remember I had to take it back on an airplane. I was afraid I was gonna have to pay extra to get my bag on the plane. So next I'm going to move on to art books, which is something I've only got a handful of. I do like a good art book, but it's also something that I'll just pick up at swaps and things. It's not something I would generally go out and purchase new, although there are a couple exceptions to that. Um, some of them I got as gifts. The first one is The Art of Alice Madness Returns, and this is a great game. It's got a very sort of 
quirky, dark aesthetic. Alice is a really fun game to play as well. I really enjoyed my time with it. And the art is just beautiful. This book has a lot of concept art, art of the different locations and things. It also covers some sort of ideas around the design. One thing I really like is how it shows uh, the different concepts for the look of Alice herself in the game. And another thing that I loved from the game is that Alice looks different depending on what world she's in. So in each world she gets a new dress, her weapons look different, and I really liked how in this you got to see that sort of up close and all of her different dresses and things in the game. So this is a really, really beautiful book uh, with a lot of great art in it. The next one is The Art of Mass Effect. And Mass Effect is one of my favorite series. I love Commander Shepard and traveling the galaxy in the Normandy and getting to know my crew. But I have to say that this isn't really one of my favorite art books. Um, it goes over, you know, the different locations, different vehicles, weapons, characters. Other than the character section, which is probably my favorite part of this book, I do find that the art of Mass Effect is a little kind of sterile, like the Citadel and everything. Everything is just so clean and pristine and, I don't know, it's almost hospital-like in its design. So the art, the sort of future -ish, futuristic art is not something that super appeals to me, which is something that I didn't really realize until actually going through this book. In the game, there's so much else going on that I don't really notice it, but just, just looking at it as art, it's not my favorite. The next one is one of my favorite games, and it is Wolfenstein The New Order. This is a great art book. I find that in Wolfenstein, as you're playing, sometimes you don't really get a chance to appreciate things. Like, the mechs are awesome, but you know, you're trying to kill them before they kill you. So you don't always get a chance to really look at the details of them, so it's neat to have it in this book. Uh, there's also some great character artwork. There's a great little page on Lee J. Blazkowicz and sort of his look through the ages that I really liked. There's also art of the other characters and it's just really, really well done. There's a lot of focus on the levels and things and the architecture of the game. And yeah, this is a very interesting one. It's great to see sort of just all those little details that you don't necessarily have the chance to appreciate while you're in game because the pace of it is quite fast and you're trying to not get killed. So these next two are both from World of Warcraft. The first one is the Wrath of the Lich King art book. I'm pretty sure this came in the collector's edition of the game. I bought a few of those back when I was still playing, generally went at midnight to go pick it up at a store. Wrath of the Lich King is not my favorite of the World of Warcraft expansions. There was some cool content in it, but I'm not really a cold person and the look of most of the game is very icy and cold. Uh, there were some great areas like Alduar, that was a fantastic raid zone, which sadly was not relevant for nearly as long as it should have been before that stupid Trial of the Crusader came out. Um, one thing I do like about this, because I really love Burning Crusade, that was my favorite of the, um, the Warcraft expansions. They do have a little bit at the end here where they seem to give a little love to Burning Crusade. There's Illidan, who's one of my favorite boss fights. Um, we've got all the different patches, the different troll patches, and the sun well, things like that, sort of bringing me back to a little warmth and the content that I enjoyed quite a bit more. But it is um, beautiful artwork, as Blizzard tends to do. And the next one I have is Cataclysm. Again, not my favorite expansion from a gameplay point of view, but I do quite like the art and the look of this a lot more. It's just got some great character art and some great locations. This is sort of the stuff that I like to see more. There's beautiful areas like Bastyr, which is all underwater and very, very colorful. Uh, what else were there? There was the environmental 
plane or environmental level. There was like a sand level with Aldum. Uh, there was a lot of really, really nice areas. Oh, also Gilneas when they introduced the new Worgen race. That was kind of a cool, spooky little area. And yeah, so I definitely liked the little looks of the new zones better in Cataclysm. I especially like this like sort of um, Cthulhu type art that they have here, which sort of permeates a lot of the different areas. But uh, yeah, and I have to say as much as I didn't particularly care for Cataclysm in terms of rating. Deathwing was a pretty awesome looking dude. So now we're on to the strategy guides and I hope to go through these a little quicker. Maybe. Some of them might take a little bit. I'm just gonna start with this which I just got recently. It is Secrets of the Games Sega CD. Official Game Secrets. So I've actually taken a look through this book and I think Game Secrets is not a particularly good uh, name for this because it's basically full walkthroughs of the games. Like they've got Secret of Monkey Island and it's basically just a walkthrough. It's not little hints and tips and secrets. It tells you how to beat the game from start to end and it looks like it's that way for a lot of other games like Lunar and Jurassic Park but still kind of cool to have them all in one book. So I'm going to start off with the collector's editions, which are a little fancier than the regular strategy guides. This first one is Alan Wake, which is one that I just got last month. It's the official survival bundle, and I've had a chance now to go through it a little more, and it's actually very, very cool. So the first part of it is Alan Wake Illuminated, and this is the story basically of the development of the game, how they came up with the location, how they came up with the different characters, how they came up with the story. There's a lot of talking to developers and things in here. And this is one I want to read from cover to cover to just learn more about this game, which I really love. And then of course the second part is the official survival guide, which is just the walkthrough. And this is a really neat walkthrough. It's a little different than most that you would see. It's written uh, sort of in narrative form, so as the walkthrough goes on, it's written like a story, so it's not like, go here, pick this up, it's like, I walked down the road, the light shut off above me, I saw something glimmering on the ground and I picked it up, it was a thermos. So it's really neat that it's more of a storytelling kind of way to get through it rather than just a set of instructions for the players to follow. There's maps, there's um, all the collectible locations and things and it sort of highlights the information that is the most important but it is surrounded by just a sort of very storytelling way of approaching getting through the game. The next one is Doom, another one of my favorite games. I really liked how they brought both Doom and Wolfenstein to life in the present day. So Doom, again, I bought this mostly just because I love the game so much. I don't actually feel a strategy guide is particularly necessary. There's some stuff about the collectibles and the maps and things which could be useful. Some stuff about the challenges even. But overall, since this is a first person shooter, I don't really find that a strategy guide is that useful. Maybe it would have told me not to empty out my BFG into the first phase of the Cyber Demon, because there was actually a second one coming, which I didn't know the first time I played it. But still, it's a nice collector's piece to have on my shelf. The next one is Dragon Age Origins, and I think this one is really do well done. I also just really like sort of the tactile feel of this particular book. Um, I love how the sort of blood stain on the front, like you can you can feel it here. Uh, it's also got the copies, of course, of signatures of different people who worked on the game. And yeah, it goes through all of Dragon Age Origins. There's some great maps in it. Uh, it tells you all about your companions, the kind of gifts you can give them and things, different things on the crafting. And another thing I really like about this, which I don't know, maybe it's weird, is that the paper feels very papery. <laughs> uh, like some of, most of these have sort of glossier pages and these are just sort of matte feeling and it feels nice. And I like touching it. 
The next one is Dragon Age 2, which is my favorite Dragon Age game. This is another beautiful book. It includes the walkthrough of the whole game. One thing that I really like about this one is how it's laid out, since there is so much choice in the game. Uh, when it goes over the each of the particular quests, it gives you the walkthrough of them, but also the consequences of doing this quest or how you will resolve it, as well as companion guidance on things like the best companions to bring in order to progress their story forward, or alternately the worst companions to bring for that. There are also tons of maps in it, notes on the different characters, a bestiary, and at the end there's a whole little Dragon Age encyclopedia which gives you information on the world of Thetis. And the last one is The Witcher, The Wild Hunt. And this one is massive. Um, if you can see here, it lays out sort of what the category is. This big thick one here, that's all the walkthrough because the game is just huge. It walks you through from beginning to end. I'm sure it was quite the task to create this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just overwhelmed any time I think about playing The Witcher 3. I did finish the game, but it was just... It was just a lot. It was great in many ways, but it was also just just a little bit too much. But this is a nice book. It does have some cool character art and concept art for the different locations at the end of it, since it's a special edition. And that's probably my favorite part of it, looking at some of the great art, as opposed to thinking about 7,000 different quests to complete in the game. So now we're on to the regular strategy guides, and the first one is Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura, which is a fantastic CRPG, possibly a little bit underrated. This is an interesting little strategy guide because so much of it would be considered appendix type things. It talks about all the different kind of magic and all the different kind of schematics you can make, characters that you can recruit to come with you, and it's got maps of everything, but the actual sort of walkthrough part of the strategy guide is very, very short. Um, it's basically just a critical path walkthrough of it, but still it's full of great information to supplement what came in the little book that came with the game. Next up is The Bard's Tale. This is the first time the series was rebooted back on the PS2. They also recently released Bard's Tale 4 on PC and on console recently, which I just played through. And the thing I remember most about Bard's Tale is that it was very, very funny. In terms of gameplay, it was just okay, but it was a very funny game. That is most of what I remember. The guide itself is your basic strategy, walking you through every quest and the final battle and giving you enemy information and things like that. It's also got a know your ale section because drinking is a very important part of barding. The next one is Dead Rising 2 off the record. This is another fairly recent pickup. I think I got it in the summer. I love the first two Dead Rising games. I loved the first one. I liked the second a little bit less just because they changed the protagonist, but off the record, they went and put Frank West, the protagonist from the first game, into the second one and sort of got rid of the guy that they had made it about originally, which I really liked. This is a good strategy guide. It's also a game that you can really benefit from having a strategy guide for in terms of where to find the different weapons and think ways to make the sort of super weapons, uh, where all the survivors and the psychopaths are. It's a very time-based game, so having this kind of information at hand is really helpful. And yeah, this is... I love this game so much. I go back and play this every once in a while. And one thing that I really liked about this was that they still, someone still had their packing slip from the game in it, and it's from Chapters Indigo, where I worked for five years when I was a teenager, so that brought back some memories. I always used to go through the strategy guides, sort of, whenever things were slow there. 
This next one is Escape from Monkey Island, which I actually haven't played yet. I picked it up on PS2 a little while ago, but I do quite enjoy this strategy guide. It's written in an interesting way. First of all, it has a hint section, so rather than the full walkthrough, you can just go through and get some hints, but it does have a full walkthrough as well, and just like the Alan Wake one, it's done in a sort of narrative style where Guybrush is telling you what he did rather than the sort of more impersonal sort of checklisty approach to doing a walkthrough through the game. The next one is Final Fantasy X and this guy has seen some better days. He looks like he's got some sun damage, maybe had some coffee spilled on him. Overall this is a pretty good hint guide. The most useful part I think is the side areas going over things like chocobo breeding and fighting the weapons and things like that. Uh, otherwise, I fi find Final Fantasy VII is fairly straightforward if you're just talking about the story. Uh, the mini games is where the most help is needed, but it'll tell you, you know, where to find missable materia and things like that, and it's full of maps and things. Next up is Final Fantasy VIII, and it's got a little sticker on here, Erica's, we'll pick up on Monday. I think I bought this from Erica Zabo, who used to make uh, YouTube videos about video games, if you're familiar with her. This is a really nice strategy guide. Uh, this is also the Final Fantasy game that I have replayed the least. So as I was sort of going through this, there was a lot of stuff that I just didn't remember from the game at all. But it's a good strategy guide, well laid out, talks about all the different guardian forces and the different enemies, and there's just a ton of maps and things that show you where the hidden save points are, where all the draw points and things like that can be found. Next is Final Fantasy IX, where we're about halfway through Final Fantasies. So this is a nice one. It's got a nice sort of reflective cover, but you'll also notice it says it is enhanced by playonline.com. And what is the point of a physical game strategy guide where you just have to go on the internet all the time? Like, I could have just gone to GameFAQs to find out that stuff if that's what I wanted to do. So as you go through, you'll find they're just everywhere. Want to know more about this? Go to Play Online. Want to know more about this? Go to Play Online. So it's kind of a stupid thing, especially since Play Online doesn't exist anymore. Next up is Final Fantasy X. This is another one that's quite nice. It has a very step-by-step -step walkthrough of the main game itself. Final Fantasy X is quite a linear game, so the main walkthrough I find isn't all that useful, although it does show where you every uh, where every chest and thing it, things are, and it also gives the walkthroughs for the temple challenges, which are probably the most challenging part of the game that someone might need a walkthrough for, but what is the most useful is the side quest stuff, specifically about how to get everyone's ultimate weapons, uh, the different Albed Primer locations, things like that it's pretty good for. There's also a whole section about <laughs> player stats for Blitzball, which seems a little excessive, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Next up is Final Fantasy X-2, which is another one of my favorite games. This is interesting because while the game is very sort of lighthearted and fun, the different systems in it are quite complex. And if there's any Final Fantasy game where I feel like a strategy guide is needed, it's this one. Um, it's not to get through the game on its own, but you can 100% this game, and if you do, you get a special little extra scene at the end. However, you can miss things very easily, and if you don't get that 100%, you don't get to see that scene. So this one actually goes by, shows you all the completion points, what your completion should be at the end of every chapter and things. Um, it's got all kinds of stuff on the various side missions and mini games, which there are a ton of. The different dress spheres and all the abilities you can get. Despite looking so sort of fun and carefree, there's just so much information 
in this game and this is probably the strategy guide that I've used most sort of had open on my lap as I've been playing the game. Next is Legend of Dragoon. Again, probably not so much needed for the walkthrough of the game, but more the extras and things. I remember playing this game, there was Stardust you had to find, there was sort of 50 hidden around the world that were very difficult to find, so this will tell you where that kind of stuff can be found. There's a little bit of information about the characters, there's a very step-by-step breakdown of going through the entire game. I've noticed that someone sort of wrote all over this, just randomly highlighting words all through the walkthrough, which is an interesting choice to make. Next is Lost Odyssey, which is a fantastic JRPG that was on the Xbox 360. I'm kind of sad that this series never continued. This is a good hint guide. Um, I didn't use it while playing the game. I didn't have it until long after I had beaten it, but it's got a very thorough walkthrough and also a very thorough just introduction about how to play the game. There's a lot of information about exactly how to use combat since the combat system is slightly more complex than a lot of JRPG systems are. Um, as well, it talks about things like the dreams and the different characters and things. I also got the strategy guide for Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. Since I haven't actually played Lunar, though I did buy it on PS1 a little while back, I haven't looked too much into this strategy guide. Although I have to say I don't love that it's in black and white. Yeah, don't want to look too much into it because I don't want to spoil it for myself. <laughs> the next one is Playboy the Mansion, which is a game I actually quite like. I did. QA on the expansion pack for it back when I used to work in games. And it's an interesting game because it's basically The Sims, except you have objectives. There's actually like missions to complete through the game. You have to build up your magazine empire, you have to hire the writers, you have to hire the centerfold, you have to do the photography, you have to have parties and invite famous people so you can get more popular. And so this guide just basically tells you walks you through that step by step, tells you all the people that you can invite to your parties and things. Going through this, I realized that there were two real names that I guess licensed themselves out to be in this, and they were Tom Arnold and Carmen Electra, which is interesting. I'm pretty sure the rest of the characters are just made up. Next up is Shadow Hearts Covenant, one of my favorite JRPGs, again, Probably not so much needing a walkthrough for the main game itself. This is more useful for all the side quests, uh, getting all the characters, their special items and things. Particularly useful for Anastasia's power, which is kind of like taking pictures of enemies in order to capture some of their abilities. Uh, it's also very good for things like the quest location, the crest locations, and the Solomon's Key Challenge, which is like one of the cooler puzzles that I've ever seen in a JRPG. Next up is Shadow Hearts from the New World, which is the third game in the series. I haven't looked into this one a ton. Shadow Hearts from the New World was a little bit of a disappointment compared to Covenant. It was okay, but just, you know, not as good on multiple levels. So I don't remember it as much. I think I've only played through it the one time, but you know, this is your basic strategy guide telling you about all the enemies and side quests and things. Another one of my favorite JRPGs, it's Star Ocean Second Story. I love this game so much. And this guide is actually pretty useful. It gives a full walkthrough of everything. It has this sort of a challenge on its hands because you can play through as either Rena or Claude. Uh, things change depending on that, so there's a lot of sort of little asides and things giving you tips for each character. Some of the most useful things on this are telling you how to recruit each of the companion NPCs, because some can only be recruited by one character and not the other. Sometimes if you recruit one, you won't be able to recruit someone later on down the line. One thing I don't particularly like about this is all of the crafting and item 
information. Uh, the game has a very in-depth crafting system and a kind of random crafting system. This does tell you who can craft things and what kind of items are needed to craft them. I just don't find it set up in a particularly good way. It could be much more clear. And then another Star Ocean. This one's Till the End of Time. Much like with Shadow Hearts from the New World, uh, this was just a bit of a disappointment after Second Story, so I haven't looked too much into this one, but it does seem like it's a very in-depth strategy guide giving you all the walkthrough as well as all of the private actions you can find in the game and a big section on item creation. And lastly is Wing Commander 3. I haven't played this game yet, so again, I haven't looked too much into this one, but it does seem to be set up in a really interesting way. It's got this full color section at the beginning, walking you through sort of the FMV bits of the game, which you can see. Uh, and then there's sections on, you know, the different flight controls, the different weapons. There's a whole section on tactics, since this is a very tactical sort of strategic game, as well as information on the particular missions. So that is all of my video game books and strategy guides. I hope you enjoyed getting a look at them. I actually put this up as a poll on Patreon. My patrons voted on what collection video they wanted me to do next, and this one won out, barely defeating the next one, which I will probably do next month. But yeah, let me know what your favorite game books are, if there's anything you would recommend to me to have in my collection. I particularly like the big sort of collector's edition coffee table books that are full of nice pictures and extra information about the games. That is all for today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.